Welcome to the new podcast, In the Garden with Susan. I'm your host, Susan Ladner. I will aim to bring you top quality information on how to save open pollinated seeds, grow a garden, and preserve what you grow. Every Wednesday, I'll be sharing practical tips and techniques to help you on your journey to food security. Join me as I preserve the abundance of produce that my garden provides. Learn new ways of putting food away for the winter and some old ways that are from another century. You can find this podcast on Shopify and at my website. Come on, let's go wander down to the garden and awaken the dreams, history, and love that is held inside every seed. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of In the Garden with Susan. And today we're continuing our look at perennial vegetables. And I think that this is going to be more than a two or three part series. As I keep doing some research, I'm finding more and more information and this looks like it, this might be going on. We, we, let's just say we're going to keep going until we reach the end. And if anybody has any perennial vegetables that they know about um, and they'd like to talk about, please uh, send me either an email so I don't miss it or leave a message on one of my social media pages and we can look at that. Because as I'm, as I'm researching them all, I'm not sure if I'm going to get them all because there seem to be more and more that are popping up in my view every time I start looking at them. And I I mean, I'm not looking at them all week long. It's really when I I come in to start figuring out what I'm going to talk about for the podcast and putting them all together that I'm finding new ones that I didn't have on my list. And so, because we all know this is busy garden time, right? And on top of that, I just, I have like, over to almost, I would say three cords of wood lot have been dumped outside my woodshed and I need to split them. And so there's that on top of everything. Like I don't have a garden to clean and new, new ground that's been broken that's sitting there. And so, you know, I, I don't do a lot of thinking about this, all the perennials, although I'm thinking about it in the garden. So if anyone has any um, perennial vegetable that they know about and I haven't spoken about, please shoot me a message and we can we can take a look about that because the more I'm seeing this, the more I'm realizing there's a lot more edible plants, I think, than we even, you know, commonly add to our diet. So we're going to get into it here. And if anybody is just tuning into this episode, we last, we ended off on Jerusalem artichokes. And so basically, they're, they're a, a type of a tuber, and they're also known as sunchokes. And they grow, they're like a sunflower. They grow like sunflowers and have edible tubers in the ground. And they are an amazing, amazing food. They have a sweet and nutty flavor, and they're crisp, and, and they can be like crisp, and, and uh, you can eat them raw. And you can also cook them or roast them. There's so many things you can do with them. And they'll hold in the ground. You can harvest them after the frost. And then you can leave them in the ground all winter long and harvest them again in the spring. And so for food security, I think this is one of the most amazing crops you can put in. Just because it's ornamental, it can be a, you know, wind block. You can throw it in, you know, a corner of the garden somewhere. Or, I mean, I'm going to be putting them everywhere here because I think I'll have nine varieties by the end of spring. So I'm going to be having them in different areas. And they are said to be invasive. And so I really don't think that's a problem with, you know, the cost of groceries going up. And if if you've got food out there, you dig it up and you eat it. It, It's not going to be invasive because if you're eating the tubers, where is it going? It's well, it's going into your tummy. So we're going to talk about the different varieties now. Um, Some of these I have found and some of them I've never heard about. But the first one is Stampede. And it is described as a high yielding thick, round, knobby, cream-colored tuber. It matures in about 90 days, and it stores well. 
and it's good for cooking and raw consumption. And they all are. So I, I don't know. I should say that for them all. And then there's next, there's red fuzzo. And again, I'm sorry if I butcher words, but that's how I'm saying it. And so these ones are long, thin, reddish purple tubers, and they're smoother and less knobby. And they take a little bit longer to mature than some varieties. And they're known for their sweet, crunchy flavor. And these ones just came in the mail. And I also have stampedes. So both of these two varieties, I'm just about to plant when we go into the root days here. And then there's white fuso, And they are tall, white tubers, and they're easy to peel. And this is something that I, I like to peel my Jerusalem artichokes. I, I've, I've read that they are, the skins are edible. Like you can chop them up and maybe cook them. I'm not sure why I have a problem with the skins. I, I did try to do some research the one time because sometimes they are a hassle to peel and I was peeling them and slicing them and, and putting them in a dip. And I was like, why am I doing this if I don't have to peel them? But I, for just my something, something about it. I just don't like to eat the skin. And maybe it's because like the potatoes, it's not good to eat. Well, some people, again, people eat the skin of potatoes, but it's not good to eat the eyes. So I, I looked it up and I mean, that's something, I guess it's personal preference, but myself, I like to always peel them. So this variety is easy to peel and it's similar to the red fuzzo and it matures slightly later. And it's said to have a superior flavor and smooth texture. And then next is a variety I've never even heard about. It's wild spinel. And they are long red tubers referred to as the fingerling of sunchokes. And they have, you know, a standard maturity period. And they're noted for their earthy, nutty flavor and are great for roasting. And if anybody uh, has any white fuzzo, or the um, wild spinel, please contact me because I'm interested in acquiring those varieties. And now we have Be Beaver Valley Purple, and I have these guys on the way, and they are a uh, purple and rose tuber. They offer unique visual appeal, and they're similar to other varieties, except they're 150 days. So this is something good to look at when we are looking at how long it takes some of these to mature. If you have a really short season, you're really far up north, like it looks like the stampede is the way to go because they're maturing in 90 days. And as I've looked at everything, that is the earliest that I've come across. So... Um, just that, to make a note about that, if you are concerned about your sunchokes maturing, look for the stampede. And I will have them available. The stampedes will be available in the fall on my website. And so now we're going to the, oh, did I finish the uh, Beaver Valley? Uh, they are, the Beaver Valley, um, they're about 150 days and they are, they add color and flavor to dishes. And now we have the clear water and they are tall plants producing potato-like tubers without runners. And this is really, this is great. So it's a concentrated, uh, concentrated set that sits there. If, if you are worried, oh my gosh, I don't want this our Jerusalem artichoke taking over my garden. I would go with the clear water and I'd also go with the Cor Corliss Bolton Hanes, which I have on my website because they stayed very concentrated together. And so the clear water, it matures within the standard growing season for sunchokes and they are good for cooking just as, you know, all Jerusalem artichokes are. And they are easy harvesting. Uh, just because they are concentrated. And then we have a variety, Squirrel Spelka Purple, and they have high yields of smooth red purple skinned tubers with a tan flesh. And they mature between 110 to 150 days. And, you know, they are suitable for all culinary applications, especially where color is desired. And so we see here people are eating the skins. You know, like they're just chopping them up and putting them in. 
And now there's a variety that I've never heard about. It's called Jack's Copper Clad. And they are long pointed tubers that are copper, purple, and rose. They mature within the standard period and they are visually distinctive and ideal for decorative and culinary uses. And another one I've never heard about, the Mullis Rose. They are noted for their unique rose-colored tubers. They mature around 150 days, and they add visual interest and flavor to dishes. And I'm just going to go through. There's a lot here. I'm not going to tell you everyone I haven't heard about because there's a lot here. And so we have the Waldboro Gold, an unusual yellow-rooted variety from the main coast. They mature within the typical Jerusalem artichoke growing season, and they are unique for their color and suitable for a variety of cooking methods. Now we have the Dwarf Sunray, and they have shorter stems and they produce round tubers. They have a shorter growing season needed due to their smaller size, and they are ideal for smaller garden spaces or container gardening. And in the show notes below, I'm, I'm going to have a list of all these. And I'm also just going to put a list of the varieties that I'm looking for. So if any of my listeners know of where I can find the ones I'm looking for, or they even have them, if you could please contact me, I because I'm, I'm very interested in, in finding a few of those these varieties. And now we have the Nahodka, and I hope I'm saying that right. And I have this variety, and it's a Russian variety with elongated tubers, and it's very tall growing and late maturing, and they produce a very nice set of tubers. Now we have the Red Rover, which they have vivid red tubers, and they're similar to other red varieties, and they are a mid to late season. And now there is the flowering, the flowering sunchoke. And um, it is notable for its ornamental qualities, similar to standard varieties. And I believe this is just the, you know, the regular Jerusalem artichoke. Uh, I've seen this in a couple catalogs. It is your your basic, it's just the Jerusalem artichoke. And I actually ordered it because I'd like to con. I'd like to, um, I ordered it, the, the two tubers from two different vendors. I'd like to compare them and see, you know, like, what are they? Are, are they a variety people had and they just called them Jerusalem artichokes? And are they different? So, and now we have the Corliss Bolton Haynes, and I carry this variety. And um, I received this from a seed saver in the Seeds of Diversity, and it was on a farm when a family moved to Canada in the early 1900s, this variety was growing on the farm. And so they are similar to other ones and they're a very concentrated set and a very nice, very productive, extremely productive plant. Like one, one tuber um, growing will give you between 20 to 30 tubers when you harvest it. So that's that for the Jerusalem artichokes. I really, I, I'm so into them right now, like just collecting them all and having them planted in different areas on the farm, just so there's food growing there because they'll just sit there and grow. It's, it's really for food security. I don't think you can beat them. And for the nutrition, like they are highly nutritious. So now we're going to get into something called the Chinese artichoke. And you guys, I'm just going to be honest here. I cannot speak Latin. The Latin names, I, I know some, maybe if some people are listening and they know how to pronounce these right, I'm probably going to be like nails running down the chalkboard, how irritating this is, how I'm going to say them. And I, I really want to avoid saying the Latin names, but at some point I know I'm going to have to. So please excuse my pronunciation. So these are the Statues Affinis. <laughs> And they produce small, crunchy tubers, and they're also known as cronas. And um, so these guys, the Chinese artichokes, they're not very widely recognized. And um, they are typically grown from tubers of the standard species 
um, itself. And I, I ordered some of these this year. I have them growing out in pots because I got them early and they came and they were just these tiny, the cutest little tubers you've ever seen. And so um, they're also, also known as knot root or artichoke betony. And how to grow these guys is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, they produce well-drained soil, rich in organic matter. And you want a sunny to partly shaded spot in the garden. And you plant the tubers in early spring, about two to four inches deep and eight to 12 inches apart and cover lightly with soil and water them. And they're low maintenance and they almost look like a mint. Um, I actually had a neighbor that came and was looking at all the, I've got a bunch of tubers and things growing out in pots while I prepare the different areas. And they thought it was a mint. And I said, oh, no, no, that's a Chinese artichoke. And so the tubers are ready in the fall when the foliage, foliage has died back. But they can also be left in the ground and harvested as needed over the winter as long as the ground doesn't freeze and so the hardiness for these guys the chinese artichokes are perennial in zones five through nine and in these zones the tubers can be left in the ground to overwinter and will sprout again in the spring in colder zones you may need to dig them up and store them over winter um, or provide a heavy mulching to protect them from the freezing temperatures. And so I'm quite interested in these guys, like how you eat them. And supposedly they're very versatile in the kitchen and you can eat them raw. Their crunchy texture makes them a great addition to salads or as a snack. You can cook them, put them in stir fries, steam them, saute or roast. And I guess the cooking enhances their natural sweet flavor. And also pickled. In French cuisine, they are often pickled and served as an appetizer. So due to their small convoluted shape, like they have really a unique, unique shape. They can be a bit challenging to clean, but a gentle scrubbing under water is usually sufficient. And they do not need to be peeled and can be used whole or sliced depending on the dish. So there's something new for us. And now we're gonna talk about the prairie turnip. And this is also a new perennial vegetable that's just come into my view. And I have these seeds coming. And so they're really a fascinating and historically significant plant. They're also known by the Native American names of Tipson and bread root, and they have been valued as a reliable food source across the Great Plains. So the edible parts of the prairie turnip um, is the large, starchy, tuberous root, which can be eaten, and the texture and flavor are often quite appealing. They have an earthy, a raw earthy taste that transforms into a sweet, nutty flavor when cooked. And so this is a hardy perennial and it is drought resistant. And so this is really an excellent choice for anyone who wants to, you know, have a low maintenance garden and, you know, in your little perennial, your perennial garden, having it out, you know, in the far reaches where it's just going to tough it out. And they grow naturally in the wild and they thrive in the prairies and tough soil conditions where other crops might fail. So if you've got an area of your garden, which I know I've got quite a few areas like this, I don't know if anything's going to grow there. This is where these guys are going. And uh, so the, the roots of the prairie turnip can be consumed in several ways. They can be eaten raw. However, they're most commonly cooked to enhance their flavor. And the roots can also be dried and ground into a flour for making bread or thickening soups. And that's the way that they were traditionally used by the Native Americans. And so they're quite a culturally significant plant. And they, you know, mostly because it could be stored for the winter. And so it's it was an essential resource for survival and sustenance during harsh seasons. So wow. Don't we all need that in our gardens with what's coming up? 
and they might be a little bit hard to get going so in case anybody finds seeds and has them coming or they order them i want to talk about how to get them going mostly for myself because when these seeds arrive for me i'm going to i'm going to need to get them started and so let's all go on the journey with me as i try and cultivate the prairie turnips from seed i believe you can also get them by root however i think i ordered them by seed i'm not sure they were cheaper that way uh but that's what I have coming. So for the for starting them, you you need to stratify stratify the seeds to improve germination rates, and this can be done by moistening the seeds and storing them in a refrigerator for about two to four weeks to stimulate winter conditions. And you want to sow the seeds in early spring as soon as the soil can be worked. And so I, for some of these things, because I don't know what they are, look like when they come up, um, I'm starting them in pots. And I have one variety now that I have them in a little container and I keep them in my, I well, because I live off grid. I don't have a fridge. and But I do have a really big cooler that I um, put frozen chunks of um i go to the neighbors and i stick jugs in the, the freezer and i bring them up and put them in the cooler and so i'm keeping it this pot in there and at night when it's going to get really cold i'll put the pot out and then put it back in the cooler in the day just to give it that that coolness and so i don't really maybe you guys are a little bit better at growing things you don't know but i need to start things in pots other if i don't know it like of course there's a lot of plants i know when i plant them i'll be that comes up i'm not going to take it out as a weed and be you know but some of this stuff i have no idea what it looks like and so the, like it says here you can sow these in the early spring as soon as the soil can be worked but i mean what's it even going to look like when it comes up with all the weeds that's my thing and so it's it's tolerant of poor, poor soil and but they will thrive in a spot with a moderate amount of organic matter so it doesn't sound like you can put these in a really great great soil because they might not do as well and once established prairie turnips require very little maintenance and they do not need frequent watering minimal weeding is needed and so because they do not compete well with aggressive weeds especially in the early stages of growth and the roots typically mature and are ready for harvest in their second year and harvesting can be done in the late fall after the first frost, which can enhance their uh, sweetness. And so with proper care, these can be a great addition to your garden. And, you know, something I think we really, we really need in the times ahead, just something sitting there. And so now we're going to look at hog peanuts. And I'm not saying the Latin word, so I'm not even going to try. And they are also known as ground beans. And they offer a unique, unique addition to both gardens and kitchens due to their dual bean production, both above and below ground. And the edible parts is that the hog peanuts produce two types of edible beans. And so... There, I guess there are beans that grow above ground on the vine, while larger, more nutrient-dense beans develop underground, resulting from the self-fertilized flowers. And both types of beans are edible and nutritious. Like, how amazing. I, I have these guys coming. I'm so excited to grow hog peanuts. And so the plant is a climbing herbaceous vine, making it an excellent choice for covering ground areas or climbing up trellises and fences. Its ability to spread can help control erosion and suppress weed growth in garden settings. And hog peanuts, or hog peanut beans, are comparable to common beans and can be used similarly in culinary application. The beans must be cooked before eating as they can be tough when raw. Once cooked, they offer a mild and pleasant taste suitable for a variety of dishes. 
and they are native to North America. So they've been traditionally utilized by indigenous people for their nutritional value, especially the underground beans, which were gathered as a reliable food source. And growing hog peanuts can be quite a rewarding project, especially for those who are interested in native plants and food secure gardens like I am. And so basically you just put the seeds directly in the garden in late spring after the threat of frost has passed and choose a location that receives full sun, sun to partial shade. The soil should be well drained, but vary in quality as the plant is quite adaptable. And because it is a climbing vine, providing support such as a trellis or allowing it to grow along a fence can help manage its growth and maximize space in your garden and water the plants regularly until they are established. Once mature, hog peanuts are relatively drought tolerant. Keep the area around the plants weed free, especially when they are young, to reduce competition for nutrients. And to harvest them, the above ground beans can be harvested in late summer or early fall when the pods mature and begin to dry. The underground beans can be dug up at the end of the growing season. Be gentle when digging to avoid damaging the beans. And so to prepare the area for them, is, or sorry, to prepare the peanuts for eating, you just need to rinse both types of beans thoroughly to remove any soil, especially the underground beans. I don't think I have to tell you guys that. And to cook them, you boil the beans for at least 10 to 15 minutes until tender. They can be roasted or incorporated into soups and stews. Like how amazing is that? I am so excited for these guys to be growing. Hopefully I will have these available on my website in the fall. And so you guys can look forward to that. And once cooked, hog peanuts can be used very much like any other bean. Try them in salads as a side dish seasoned with herbs and spices or mashed into spreads and dips. And so how amazing is that? Okay, I'm just going to check the time because I think before we get into, I, I don't think I'm going to get into anything else. Well, maybe I can. Let, let's, we've got so much to get through to cut this short just because I don't want to go into something else. We're going to talk about Oka now. And I am so excited to have found this. I've been looking for Oka for years, like years. And I found some and I have it growing outside. It's a very unique little plant popping out of the pots. And so it is a vibrant and intriguing tuberous plant that originates from the Andean highlands, but has adapted to various climates and culinary traditions around the world. With its colorful tubers and pleasant taste, Oka is becoming a favored choice among gardeners and chefs alike. And so the perennial part of oka is that it can be cultivated as a perennial in warmer climates and it will reliably produce tubers year after year without the need for replanting and it is a low maintenance crop however in the colder climates like zone five uh, oka is generally not winter hardy if left in the ground and it's uh the tubers can freeze. And so I have it planted as soon as it arrived, I put it in pots and I, when there's chat, when it's getting really cold out, I'm bringing it in and out. I've been babying my Oka. Well, of course I don't want to lose it. It's taken me so long to find a couple tubers. And so you, I think it'd be like a potato, right? You're bringing it in for the winter and putting it out after the frost is out there's no chance of freezing and so gardeners in these in the colder regions often grow oka as an annual and they harvest the tubers at the end of the growing season and they store them through the winter months just what i said and so basically growing oka you just place the tubers in the spring in the ground and uh, you don't want to damage the young plants because they cannot handle any frost or anything and they thrive in a sunny spot but they can also tolerate some partial shade 
And so they're very versatile to different garden layouts. And the soil should be well-drained and moderately fertile, but and it does not pro perform well in waterlogged conditions. And regular watering is crucial, especially during dry spells to support robust tuber development. And the harvest occurs in late autumn, ideally after the first frosts, uh, which will make sure that it's uh, they're sweeter. And so we are out of time. We're, we're going to continue next week. And so I hope that you guys have a great week. There's a lot to do. We're about to move into root days. And so we will see you in the garden. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of In the Garden with Susan. I hope you enjoyed hearing all about some perennial tubers and such as we continue our journey into perennial vegetables and will it ever end. <laughs> uh, you can find this episode and others at Spotify, Radio Public, Podchaser, headliner it's on my youtube channel garden fairy botanicals and on my rumble channel as always it is on my website at www.gardenfairybotanicals.ca and i look forward to chatting with you next week when we will continue on with perennial vegetables because they go on and on and on literally <laughs> i hope you have a great week in the garden see you next week <laughs>